see the AoE 2 go in AoE 4 action, and that's what we're going to see right now. He is up against an unidentified Smurf, though. This Smurf being very capable, clad Kaka, after only about 220 games being up at 40 foot on the leaderboard. I don't know. Maybe it's a new face. Maybe it's not a Smurf. All I know is we've got some England on Mongol action. Let's get underway as we hop into this one. It is going to be here on Lipany. So... Lipany is an interesting one, actually. I've talked about this before, but I think England has better advantages on Lipany than they do on Dry Arabia. Against the Mongols as well, it's definitely something you can utilize due to the vision advantage that you can maintain around the, the Stealth Forest. So I think, actually, first thing to highlight in this matchup specifically that can matter a lot is outpost play and outpost control. I don't know if we're going to necessarily see any early outpost aggression. I think there's certain players that lean heavily into it when they play England or when they play Mongols. Um, and I don't know enough about Clad Kaka. As I said, he's a very recent account. As for Viper, he doesn't really outpost spam that much, it has to be said. I don't feel like I often see him go for the early outpost rushes that a lot of England players do. Instead, he's playing a very kind of unorthodox England style where I think like he aims for a later time. He either tries to go in early with Lombos and Rams and end the game. Or instead, he falls back and thinks more like Castle Imperial type timings. It's quite intriguing to watch, actually, because when you look at a lot of the highest level players, like Beastie, like the Muslim, there's a lot of heavy leverage of towers in the early game. There's a lot of kind of starvation intended. And if they do end up going Castle and whatever you have, it's because A, they've been heavily repulsed, or B, they've delayed their opponent enough that they can comfortably reach Castle clearly ahead of them without their opponent being able to get there as well. But we'll see if that comes into play in this type of matchup. In theory, like given the style we just talked about with Viper, I expect Clad Kaka to be the aggressor in this matchup. Just because the Mongols are still fairly formidable, like with their timing and the Dark Feudal Age, they can actually ramp up quite quick. And also Viper, as I said, isn't the, the like true aggressor that we maybe see from other England players right now. But it has to be highlighted, folks. Mongols are looking... Yikes. They're looking yikes. I think yikes is the only way I can describe it, really. They're not looking pretty. So statistics-wise, in 1v1s right now, Mongols, you know, they, they went from their ultra-dominant, powerful, like, you know, top-tier, kind of uh, best-of-the-best rating to a very low one, at least in the M4C front. I believe they were, like, bottom three in terms of civs, win rates for M4C. Now, that can come down to just popularity pick, right? And a lot of players just not doing good with it as a result. Um, because when we look at it on the ladder side, in fact, if you just look at like the 1600 and above right now via AOE4 World, right now Mongols are second place with 53.2% win rate. They're still looking phenomenal. The interesting part to me is that England is actually the weakest of all the civs in pub matchmaking at the highest level with a 42.6% win rate. And this is where it gets interesting, actually, because England, one of the things you have to know is actually when you look at the... The, the length of games, they tend to do a lot better around the 35 to 45 minute mark. The whole intent being like once you arrive in Imperial Age, they can kind of scale up network of castles, they can ramp up in that regard, and, and they can benefit from the eco booming in Castle and Beyond. But you have to reach that point, right? It's kind of weird to watch it, actually, because it feels like England right now lose a lot of games when you expect them to win it. Between, I'd say, around the 15 to, say, 30-minute mark, that's where some of their weakest win timings are right now. And these are all stats for the highest level, guys. I'm not talking about stats from, like, low-level games. I'm not talking about stats from my games or, you know, your, you know, your drunk nanny who occasionally hops on your PC on the weekends and doesn't even know which way to use the keyboard. I'm talking about the best of the best players in the game, the, the primas. But we'll see what Viper can do in this one. Because, you know, he is premium, premium, right? In a lot of people's eyes. Of course, not looking that way in M4C. It has to be said, you know, he was he's fairly dominated. And one thing that Viper was kind of very uh, introspective about, very kind of honest about, was that his build orders were kind of off, right? He didn't, like, you know, Viper has been on his players that historically he's very good at adaptation in the moment, like choices that overwhelm his opponents. But his build orders were the thing that he seemed to be lacking. And that was something that a lot of the other players picked up on as well, right? They had these kind of cool strategies, these clear flows to their the build orders or the strategies they want to implore. And Viper would always kind of end up being one step behind. But it seems like he's at least practicing a lot of England right now. And as I said, because he focuses on a later time in the most English players I've seen in the top 100, I'm curious to see whether what he's trying to pull off here, what he's trying to like maximize and perfect is actually going to be good or if it's just going to be a waste of time. Of course, you know, waste of time is maybe a harsh way of referring to it. You know, there's always lessons and everything. But let's see what the lesson is here today. Clarka 
understandably, Clyde Kaka being up against an English player, he didn't go for the spear spam. He didn't go for the outpost spam. And this is one thing to highlight. If you want to go for an outpost spam as Mongols, you really do have to go spears. I don't think you have the same flexibility you used to. The impact on the scout rushing, like from the difference in, in the food cost now, has kind of crippled the Mongols' ability to like use scouts instead of spears to quickly like man outposts on the other side of the map. And then also with the Uvu being nerfed now to harvest stone per minute passively based on the age you're in, as you can see there with the numbers. Whereas I believe before it was like 105, 110. Now like to get similar effect, you have to go up the castle. It means it slows down the like the impact of Zerging in the early phase of the game. And I think that's actually hurt the Mongols a lot and something that a lot of players have been struggling to get used to. While there's still a lot of strategies that are working in the highest level pubs we're talking about, in a competitive environment, we're seeing Mongols struggle because the timings feel a little bit wonky. They feel a little bit off. And I think a lot of the highest level players are still kind of trying to figure it out because all of a sudden, like, your juju's off, right? The flow ain't right. Something feels wrong because for so long, Mongols functioned pretty much the same way. But this Uvu change... I think really did hurt them. Uvu, the scout, like nerf costs, like these things added up over time. It's why we're seeing what Clad Kaka done as an opening more, where you go into the pasture as an opener just to try and sustain your food to begin with. So you're the one playing condensed economy. It's very weird to say as well of the Mongols, because, you know, condensed economy, when I use those words, we've always talked about sieves like the HRE, never the Mongols. But look at this coming out of Viper. We said he's not really much of an outposter, but he understands the value of at least one outpost as a staging point for England. And he gets it on the high ground. And this is one of the advantages of Lippany. The high grounds and also the stealth forest. These are things that England can heavily leverage to their advantage to just ambush their opponents fully. However, it can also be used against them, which is why they need to keep vision around them. Yeah, movement speed on Clad Kaka's horseman coming out. Will assassinate onto the villager. Caught out in no man's land. They'll take that small extractive value there. Lombo count a little bit too healthy, but Horsemen not in early phase anymore, so they are tanking themselves. In the meantime, I think Viper, this is a bit of a misstep. The way he's getting caught out with Straggler Lombo man, shouldn't be occurring. Like, the village is understandable. Any additional value should not be found by Clad Kaka, especially after you just got such an easy peasy trade against him, right, with the, the double snipe out on the Horseman. And remember, folks, this is a heavy investment every time he spams out these Horsemen, because like we said, you get less value out of the Uvu now than you used to. So, like, it, I, I'm pretty sure it was either 105 or 120. I think it was around 105 or 110, if I recall correctly, because it was the passive stone per minute you used to get. But as you can see now, it's 80, 100, 120, and 150. The whole point being, when you get to Imperial Age, especially with the nerfs to, like, building monuments, they want to bolster the, the Mongols elsewhere to make sure they might be able to reach the monument costs. And I think that was one of the choices there. Also, it makes realistic sense when you consider in the late phase of the game, like Imperial Age stuff that like you're pushing out, they, they tend to be more pricey, right? They're a lot more expensive. So consider the fact that you replace the cost of a, units in full with stone instead. Obviously, it makes sense. Like in later game, you're going to want those quicker like gathering rates if you're pushing lances. It seems more balanced that way. I do like this change. I think this is a really good change because it, it definitely gives Mongols a little bit more power in the ultra late game phase because it's, you know, like we said, it's 105 it used to be. So once you reach Castle and beyond, you're getting more stone than you used to, which means you should be able to push out more of those premium units. But it, it definitely warps the timing of the Mongols. And I think that's something some players struggled with recently is trying to figure out, like, is this Civ still, like, really good for Feudal? Or has the trend that we were seeing already where it's like, Delay someone's feudal so you can rush castle, the better way to go. And I think it's the secondary. I do think the Mongols, weirdly enough, have quickly become kind of a castle age oriented uh, Sith. Although that could change again soon. One thing I have to highlight is, of course, there, there are upcoming changes around build speed of siege weapons in the field. And that's one big edge the Mongols currently have that, that might be disappearing soon, folks. And look at this. There's a reason I keep saying horsemen are the boss unit in the game, and this is exactly why. No other unit can do that to a scout. Maybe the Khan, the Khan can. Okay, I'll give you the Khan, but he's only got four damage. But no other unit can chase down like that, like the horseman just did. It's such an important detail as well, because now Viper is playing blind. That assassination in conjunction with taking down the outpost means Viper is reduced to the vision of his base. A critical detail now, as Clad Kaka has the ability to do whatever he wants on the map. And this is why a lot of players, no matter the Civ, play into horsemen now it's the fact that you can dictate flow around the map you can dodge bad fights you don't want then you have added benefits on the side like the scouting vision denial we talked about that allow you to maintain vision quickly rapidly across the map while your opponent sees nothing and it's so unfortunate for viper because he really wanted to see this viper he hasn't 
got ready for attack up at all. He's been scaling the cross, right? He's transitioning to farmlands. He's been building a sizable Lombo army. And when he spots out, when he hits that there's a tech up in the castle at Klakaka, he's not going to be in position to punish that at all after his outpost was denied on the front. It has to be said, with this many horsemen in the field as well, even if he was in position, it wouldn't be easy. Klakaka. He's just going to be vibing. He's just kicking back in the chair right now. He's like, I'm playing Mongols, all right? I haven't played, like, I'm playing two months. I heard they always win. Yeah, you might be right there. Because this definitely feels like an easy peasy game. You can see he's already prepping the racks. Looking to push out those man at arms. Man at arms that uh, Viper can't really address right now. Yes, sir. Now, don't worry, folks. If you thought things were bad for Viper, they can't get worse. These campfires will not set fire to the farms. I know my uh, my immersion is ruined. And just look at that. Kakaka, he's able to get away with that drive-by. He wouldn't have if it wasn't for the tech up. If he, Well, maybe he would have still got away, but we're doing 10 HP maximum. That's the other thing that's ridiculous about Castle Age, right? They nerfed the damage of the Khan, but they didn't nerf the health. Basically, they wanted to keep the health scaling very well for the Mongols Khan because they want this unit to be able to survive. It would be so trivial if you could just walk in and instantly kill it at the beginning of the fight. That being said, let's be real, guys. Come on, if you've got two bombards late game, bye-bye, horsemen. <laughs> like, all of a sudden, the Khan has learned to fly, fly in a bowling ball, right? But, like, realistically, at this stage of the game, this is the thing. He can just come in like this. He can get peppered by arrows. And he can usually run away. The funny thing is, Clyde Kaka seemingly is doing this to distract his opponent. However, mistakes made. The Khan is going to be assassinated. And I don't think Clyde Kaka had to do that. If he went to the southeast side, I think he would have got out of range. So, a little bit of a whoopsie-daisy. Slips and falls on a pile of bricks there. And uh, all of a sudden, your initial posturing might feel a little bit flimsy. Because one thing that we have to highlight here is Yam did get nerfed. This was a big deal, folks. You're now punished if you don't establish an outpost network as the Mongols. The Yam movement speed only lasts 10 seconds. That isn't going to be long enough to even get you halfway towards your opponent's base. Watch watch the golden aura disappear in two seconds. I know. I know. My count is terrible. I, I, I can't tell the time. One, two. There we go. See? It, it's just gone. So now you're moving at 1.12 movement speed. You're moving the speed of a Lombo. It's not pretty. Horseman in the meantime, haven't been invested in by Clad Kaka. He needs an outpost. He, I, I, I cannot emphasize this enough. He needs an outpost on the front to push in with. Because then, with that boosted movement speed from the Yam, he can actually chase his opponent down. It's a sizable advantage as well. 15%, you can see it there. 1.29 movement speed allows you to gap those Lombos. And Clad Kaka, because he doesn't have that posture, and you see he had to cancel the Maganel, he really needs to get one or two of them in the, on the field right now. Because Viper, he's about to lose his weakness. Tech up complete, baby. He's here. And also prepping for his own man at arms. His own man at arms, although he needs to get two upgrades on the way because he's still in Vanguard status, they'll be better in melee clashes. As you can see there, they get the ranged and melee armor bonuses from this beautiful tech armor clad. Of course, they won't have the movement speed, but they will function as a front line. And considering that Clan Kaka still seems to neglect the necessity of having an outpost on the front, this will hurt him. Lombos just making a little campfire party. Everyone brought their tents. Meanwhile, back in the uh, chill state for Cloud Kaka's economy. I don't think he's been under fire all game, actually. I don't think he's... Yeah, no villagers have ever been exposed, right? But Viper's able to recover, right? Like, he's got these two TCs now, which is why Cloud Kaka feels the need to go. I just don't know if he's going to go quick enough. The Lombos are going to pick you apart. Look at the damage they're doing right now. Three damage is going through. Remember, five of being might to get it, but these units do eight damage right now. And soon they'll do more because he hadn't even got Steeled Arrow yet. So this is about to get worse. You need to be very careful. Maganel's trying to extract value. The shot is decent. But Viper, not giving up yet, knows he can sidestep and back away before he'll be punished by one Maganel, one measly Maganel. Villagers. Ooh, Viper trying his luck there. Has got the textile, so it won't hurt too much. Needs to respect the damage that Double Maganel can now do, though. And that's why he's getting a Siege Workshop in the back. Straight away into a marketplace as well. Needs to be able to trade across for the required gold. Not really gathering in large quantities right now. In fact, his income per minute looks as bad as the, the, you know, the, the interest rate I get on my current account. To be honest, this does not look good. And it's decreasing, like my current account. I buy too many stupid things. Maganel will snipe out one village on the side. Scout. Yeah, I don't think that's going to do it, Viper. Instead, you can kick rocks. 
Oh, the rocks will kick you down the road, really. Consider how big they are. And this Magus, I mean, they can do some serious damage. The Man at Arms, I don't know why they're going over here. I think he's trying to pop cap Viper, but I'd be more focused on getting rid of this King's Palace. Instead, he'll just back up, establish more Maganels. Viper, hold him for the moment, but he needs a solution soon. Spruils, they can't even come up because of the pop cap. This has actually worked out for Klakaka, and it's about to get better. He's about to die further. Oh my god, he gets the house just in time to get the Springwood out. That's actually big. That's an important detail right there, because now he can start to push the Maganels back. A Springwood being built by Klakaka in the field, but he has to give over some ground in the meantime, and damage is being done. Springwood still chasing, not able to get in range. Lombos will open fire. Springwood is exposed. Glad Kaka will stick on top of it as well, so we'll burn the Spiral down. Second one was not being built by Viper either, so he's definitely going to be punished once more. Because now it's three Magos in the field, a Spiral soon to be built. And Viper, although he can push back for the moment, he has to be careful about how far he pushes out. And he still has not started producing these mana arms yet. This Rax investment, it, it's such a big question mark right now. You look at it and you wonder, what the hell was the point? And the point was that he got caught out, folks. He's like, he's flowing some additional food gold now, right? But at the time, he was being drained on that front. He needed to keep pushing villages. He wanted more Lombos because they're more reliable right now. The issue with the Man at Arms is when you see this many Maganels coming to your base, you can't go for them anymore because it takes them too long to gap close. And in that time, three Maganels will break them apart. And I like this. Finally, Clad Kaka, it took him a little bit longer than maybe necessary. But finally, the outpost is going to go down. That movement speed advantage is going to be big. It's going to be problematic for Viper as well. He needs to respect the effect this can have. I mean, just watch what happens once that is complete. 0 0.75 up to 0 0.86. It sounds so small, so baby level. But genuinely, folks, it's a big difference maker for Maganels. And that gap close factor is something Viper's going to have to be acutely aware of. Magos. One of them never got repaired. Big mistake there, actually. Klakaka, he has two villages, three villages in the front, and he never used them to repair the Magos. And that's costly. Remember, these are not cheap units, as you can see right there. 400 wood, 200 gold. Also, valuable time of your men at arms that can be used burning down buildings, wasted to rebuild them. It definitely hurts the timing for Klakaka, and it's buying a lifeline for Viper. Viper. Getting kind of that critical mass where you can start to assassinate these men at arms one by one. See, two and a half volleys and damage done, really. And this man at arms count, I don't feel like it's actually been increasing really that much for Klakaka. Not as much as it should be. Not as much as the Lombo count has. But now the switchover, Lance has come out. Small quantity, though, and that's not going to be good enough. Village is moving around. Maganels get sniped. Klakaka. Oh, he takes the bait. He runs away with the man at arms count, and it means he has nothing to defend his valuable siege weapons. And I feel like Klakaka, he's being played like a fiddle right now. Viper just throwing crayons at him. He's like, learn to draw, bud. Because right now, it feels like Clad Kaka is a six-year-old being tutored by the teacher. And all of a sudden, this outpost infrastructure, this, this network, this daisy chain in you built up has crumbled so quickly. The only good news, these outposts are, are not easily assaulted right now for Viper because he only has the Lombos. But yeah, I was about to say, it's got to be a Treb. There's no way he's not getting a Treb here. You're just going to get through the outpost network easy peasy. And you'll prevent a new one from ever going up. Because remember, folks, these trebs, they've been slept on for a long time, but people, they've started to awaken to just how potent they can be with their ridiculous 16 tile range compared to these measly 10 range springles that can only go up to 12 for most sieves when they reach Imperial. Speaking of springles, they'll try to snipe onto the villages. A lot of villages here that are exposed, though. And Viper, oh no, they're going the wrong way around. But looks like he can't focus fire right now. And Viper seemingly pulling back more of his eco than he should have. Well, oh wait, no, I see what's happened. He hasn't put down a mill. The efficiency re. But he will focus on repairs for now. Make this a harder thing for Klakaka to breach. I feel like right now, Klakaka... There's no easy in, right? You can see he's trying to wrap around these lances, but after he sacrificed his main battalion, as well as the siege weapons, like I think he'll sacrifice one of those two things, but not both. He's lost his timing. Everything feels, like, uncomfortable now, right? Like, Viper has an eco lead, military lead as well. You've got a foothold in his base, but that's going to fall in the blink of an eye, as we just see there from the Treb. And you can't help but feel, in the blink of an eye, 
Clad Kaka could very suddenly now lose this game. He's gone from an overwhelming lead, probably being 75-25 favorites, to I'd say about 55-45. In fact, I'd say it's 55 in favor of Viper now, as his Lancers get pinched in the corner. Viper with the pincer maneuver. A good trade, only losing four or five of his Lombos to get rid of five or six of these Lancers. Definitely worthwhile. Now Spiral's moving in again. Clad Kaka. He can't rely on Spruels alone, though. He needs something more. They can't even assassinate these villagers. It takes three shots to do so. However, he will be able to chase in. Seeing the Lombos are out of position, he punishes it with the Yam movement speed. He's in. However, the villagers are also in the TC. And these mana arms will not be able to burn this down. This is a mistake by Clad Kaka. Hanging around here is detrimental to the success of his army. Instead, he needs to peel past it. However, there are man arms waiting here. Lombos as well. Viper doing a fantastic job of stationing sentries on each side of his base to ensure that he can't be wrapped on. Means it's so easy to react instantly to this force. And Clad Kaka once again taking an unfavorable trade. Viper con just continuing to build that eco lead, right? It's not slowing down. And the military count now, almost tripling up Clad Kaka. It's about to be Clad Clapper, as in Clappered out of this game, because I, I feel like we said it already before, right? He's lost full momentum in this game. And now we might reach that critical point. A lot of what he's doing is exposed. His Uvu is out in the middle of no man's land, two men at arms burning it down. If he gets spotted on the step readout at any point, this game is over. Because he won't have the surplus eco to even remotely catch up to Viper. And make no mistake, folks, Clad Kaka is in full catch up mode still. These man at arms. They haven't even got the yeah, they haven't even got the armor clad upgrade yet. I mean, if they had that, th these trades, like they're not even ever gonna be close. You need more Maganels, you need them fast, but Clad Kaka, he's really struggling on the limitation of his economy. He's flowing a lot of wood, and we might be looking at a secondary TC play, something that has become more popular with Mongol players after the more recent patches. But it looks like no, it's just gonna be more siege weapons. And this is one of the delicate issues with the, the Mongols, right? Is you need all that wood into your siege line. You can't easily afford to go in and, and buy a TC that costs 900 wood when you're going to be so budgeted due to Maganel production. So I think in this situation, it should be the second TC. Like, I, I think the, the, it's a bit of a gamble, but the advantage you have is Viper's shown a lot of like defensive posturing, right? He's gone man at arms, he's gone Lombos. You're still pushing in one or two Lancers at a time that will distract him in the back of his base. And Viper has shown um, a precipitation to like overreacting to small raids, right? Like the, when he sees one or two Lancers riding in from the north, he sends the entire army there, right? Bar like 10 units. So I think that's something you can use to your edge. If you're Clad Kaka, you should be going for a secondary TC, playing maybe into the bottom south side where it's safe, and then essentially just running tiny raids to distract Viper. He will eventually reach critical mass, but the whole point right now is he's going to reach critical mass regardless of what you're currently doing. Should you choose to go for a second TC, at least you have a chance to bounce back. But this Mago like count right now, it, it feels like you're working on a hope and prayer. My issue with this Mago play is there's no Siege Workshop. If there was a Siege Workshop and he bothered to get this juicy piece of tech right here, the Greasled Axles, I think this is better. But my issue is like he's making this weird kind of like half-half play that I see a lot of Mongol players do. Where instead of falling back and, and spiking their eco off a second TC, they continue to invest in siege weapons. But when they're being outpaced and they can't get on top of what they need to assassinate Maganels, they never drop a siege workshop and get greased axles because they're so focused on using every piece of surplus wood to build even more siege weapons. Here you go. This is what I mean. Like, like this, I like this part of the play from Clad Kaka. Wrap around the north, wrap around the south, send troops in, distract them, buy more time. That part is good. My issue is, like, look at the army in the center. Look how much of it is just siege. And it seems like a good idea, yeah. But your opponent has Sprinkles as well. You aren't exactly building, like, an unassailable number of Sprinkles. In fact, I would say Viper's economy is approaching a point where he could sustain production out of Double Siege Workshop and just amass Sprinkles ahead of Clad Kaka. And I wouldn't be surprised if that's what he does soon. In fact, he's building a keep. Another fantastic choice, by the way, because remember, the English, your keeps are production buildings. They are every production building in one. So he can actually use this as a secondary Siege Workshop as well as a defensive staging point to actually push out additional Siege Weapons. And now, you talk about limitation, like Clad Kaka can build quicker with his Sprinkles, yes. But he can't afford them as quickly as Viper can. And Viper, oh my god, he went right around the back with the Man-at-Arms. 
And that's going to force a defensive response out of Clad Kaka. A Viper, he gets the valuable info. He sees the Archer range is not in use. He sees the Man at Arms and the Lancers count is still healthily being pushed out by Clad Kaka. But he understands that there's no transition coming. So he has to be feeling comfortable right now. And more Magas. I, I, this is... This feels like a little bit of over -calib overcalibration. You can see what Viper is doing as well intentionally. He sent out two Lombo, now he sends out two Spears. Three Spears, in fact. He's just looking for info, and he's going to get that info. Look what he sees. Oh, more Maganels being built. Oh, Maganels attacking. Like, he sees the entire army, and all it costs him is a Spearman. That's a worthwhile trade. If you could pay 80 resources to see your opponent's formation, you do it. In fact, this Spearman, if he keeps going west, he's going to spot out the gold battalion. And if he spots that out, if that ever gets shut down, Clack Kaka's in trouble. And keep in mind, Klakaka doesn't want to move away from here as well because he's got double vein to tap through here. And you get a lot of value. It'll last you a long time. Remember, the step readout giving that extra 50% drop-off. This is a 1,200 gold vein. This is a 600... Uh, 6,000... Wait, did I say 1,200? 12, 12,000 gold vein. Maths. This is a 6,000 gold vein. There's a lot of value on this hill that could be denied. The only thing stopping Viper is he's still running a static force. So it's very hard to chase down and completely deny and punish the step readout gold. Emo south side. Looks like they're trying to punish Viper though. This outpost crew, I like this from Clad Kaka, just trying to box his opponent in. Also, it allows him flanking maneuvers more quickly. The Yam movement speed, right? This is the purpose of setting up this network. Your Lancers can move in very quickly. They need this as well because that movement speed boost only lasts 10 seconds. As we speak of that, fight underway. Not many springs from Viper. Viper! Oh, this might have been a bit greedy. More springs are coming out. Looking for the initial trades. Not going to be good though. A lot of springs just burn. Oh, Gladkaka. He's got the edge here. Lombos are still a problem, and he can't easily gap close them, but he's got rid of the anti-siege. More anti-siege is rolling out, but it's doing so slowly for Viper. And he needs to address those Maganels, or he'll have to keep giving over ground. There's not much ground left to give. New Siege Workshop going down as well. And just as I was quickly saying how amazing this could be for building additional spring walls, it doesn't seem like that's a use for Viper. That's because right now he's gold capped. And Viper, I think that's his limitation right now. He needs access to this central gold deposit. He got denied on the southeast side. He has no other gold. He needs to push out soon. And it looks like the raid round the back was successful. He shot Klakaka down. Klakaka still having a lot of surplus to work with, but he's not gathering on the gold right now. He had to retreat away. In fact, look at the man arms. They're distracting everything. Klakaka, he has to peel back the entire army. He can't push forward with his advantage. And Viper, with a small contingent of tanky man at arms, has bought himself another lifeline. Those villagers, some are going to die. Lance is going to try and hold the area. In the meantime, Lombo move, moving forward as well. Khan is going to fall. And all of a sudden, Clark Kaka has to defensively maneuver his entire army and give that wiggle room that Viper needs. And as a ripple effect of this, he's instantly under the gold veins. Both of them, in fact, realizing that he's not going to be denied there anymore. And now he can get that most needed resource that he requires to continue pushing out those anti-siege units. All right, this is big. That maneuver was really big. That was so actually like high level. A lot of players wouldn't have done that, especially with Man of Arms. I have to give credit to Viper. That is the second time he's found his way right round to the back of Clad Kaka's eco lines, and it's definitely having impact. Because even if your army dies, even if you barely kill any villagers, it's the fact that your opponent had to retreat. It's the fact that when they were on the offensive, when they had a foothold in your base, they have to surrender it to go and put the fire out in their own barn. And Viper. AFK, uh, what? Uh, what? <laughs> All right, I, you know what, right? <laughs> if if this monk had gone to the gym every day of the week for six months, he could carry both those relics, but I'm afraid not, old man. All right, ba back to your wheelchair, buddy. You haven't got the arm strength to carry two relics at once. Viper still hasn't realized, by the way. <laughs> he hasn't banked a single relic yet. Oh, God. Hey, maybe Clad Kakako won't realize either, and it'll be a wall lol player. Who knows? Right in, though, from the Lancers. They have to cancel. They can't go for the trip. Defensive keep going down for Viper. He needs it quickly. More villagers moving across as well. Lombos just trying to splint themselves. Spearman and Man Arms now coming in. Viper, he was posturing in the center. So he will have to block this attack. However, the Maganels are getting in range, and there's a lot of them. Five shots coming out. Heavy damage done. Viper loses half the front line. Second salvo incoming as well. That front line is about to fall. And Viper, he tries to start a step away from it. Minimizes the casualties to a degree, but most of his front line is dead. However, Clad Kaka, not confident to push in, not with the keep on line. Instead, going to give over some ground, wrap around. Man at arms trying to get on top of the Maganels. Lombos in danger right now. They have to back up. Shots coming out. 
Nice start step there. Able to formation shuffle it away and minimizes the damage without losing any Lombowman. And with the campfires, they can heal up. And Trebs in the meantime, trying to address the Maganels because Spiritals just can't do it. There aren't enough of them. Screwing upgrade in the outpost is good though. And Clad Kaka did not notice that until it was too late. So he loses one of the Magos. Heavy damage done to other siege weapons. And Clad Kaka, a mistake I feel keeps being made by him. He needs to have someone out here repairing this. I, I, I shudder to think how many siege weapons have been lost because they're never getting repaired. Yes, you're behind economically, but you can somewhat like buffer yourself, right? Like if you think about the one villager difference of one villager being up here repairing all these versus what is gathering at home, it's making up the difference compared to you having to rebuild a 600 resource unit every time it dies. Also, despite the lead, with Plakaka being on the Golden 69, being a total of 40 eco units behind Viper. Remember, that because he has 22 people on gold, it's actually more like he has 79, maybe about 80, compared to the 100, 910. So it's still a big lead, but it's not as dire of a lead as it seems because of the power of the step readout. This is why Castle, quickly as possible, is such a powerful time for the Mongols because of that additional influx of gold they can get. Trebs, not targeting out the keep here. A lot of palings in the field. <laughs> uh, uh, is is Viper worried about people stealing horses and leaving his base? These palings suggest so. A little bit of drunk palings going on there. Meanwhile, more raids in. This time, Spearman. Oh, and there was never textiles upgrade from Kakaka. Oh, that. That feels like such a mistake. And so many players make this mistake. And I understand why Clad Kaka makes this mistake. You're playing from behind on the eco side. Your opponent is booming up, right, with double TC. You feel like any time you stop, even once, producing one villager to get textiles, is putting you further behind. And what reason had he until recently to even think about textiles? You know, if you think about the first half of this game, Viper wasn't raiding his base at all. He was in full control. But now look how defensive he has to go. He has to establish an outpost network to pad himself because there's always that threat. And Viper, oh my god. He, he can see this. Yeah, and they're out of position. The Lance is arriving now, but some villagers might fall. It looks like actually the villager rebellion is going to be good enough. There's enough here that they will be able to protect themselves. They don't even need Lances. But that's just the fragile state, right? Like, Clad Kaka, one of the risks you get into when you get into late game as Mongols is the map starts to spread like this. On open maps especially, your eco is going to be exposed. Outposts can protect you, but walls cannot. You don't have that benefit. You can't build them. So you're heavily reliant on having aggressively postured outposts to give you the heads up of where your opponent is going and then give you that knee-jerk time to react to it. However, in this situation, as Viper starts to strip that vision away, that's when Clyde Kaka has to get very paranoid and very uncomfortable about the state of this game. On the Spearman are going around the back again. They keep finding sneak-ins. However, this time, Clyde Kaka is going to pursue, but he's pursuing with the whole battalion, and this is dangerous. Look what's happening in the front. Lombo's a poke again. And that's going to force him back further. And that's the space Viper wanted. Look what he's ready for. Clyde Kaka, both of players had stopped heavily investing in their military force and stopped pushing. And as a result, it was obvious that both players were going for a tech up. But Viper is going to beat Clad Kaka to the punchline. And ironically enough, the Civ that has a gold booster to the, the eco benefits, they're the one, that, that's the resource that lagging behind him, right? Like he had the required food, the gold was lacking. It means his tech up is going to be slightly later. And that means Viper's taking the opportunity to drop a Ford Berkshire Palace in the center of the map. And this will give him a new staging point very close to his opponent's base and full advantage of that Stealth Forest, something that Clad Kaka can no longer boast about. Wrap around on the Yuvu. Important to snipe these out as well because you, you know how this goes, folks, right? It's always White Stupa. You go up in the White Stupa, you get access to the Passive Stone, and then you always have a staging point for your military district. Well, you want that additional stone coming out from your Uvis elsewhere. And if you keep burning them down, if you keep denying them, that's a huge chunk of, of surplus unit production gone from Clad Kaka's economy. And Spears in again. And there haven't been any spruiled upgrades yet, but the garrisons are going to come out. Some damage is going to be done. Still no textiles. Clad Kaka, he garrisoned, but he didn't stop gathering. And I'm surprised as well. Now he's a little bit boxed in. Several villagers are going to fall because these spearmen have a decent amount of health, 110. In the meantime, a raid comes in from Clad Kaka, but this damage will not be felt as dearly. Remember, it's two TCs versus one. Knights will hang around. They'll start to butcher. Viper will finally realize what's going on and will begin to garrison. One or two spearmen will be good enough to finish off these lances, and that will get rid of the assault coming out. Meanwhile, Viper's not done himself. He's in with the man at arms. 
and he's condensing everything to one point now. And that means he can start to pull his opponent apart. This is actually remarkable about a Viper. It's all because, despite the fact that Kladkaka went for Cavalry, he didn't really find a way to heavily utilize it for raiding. But weirdly enough, the player without Cavalry has been more effective at raiding. He's found ways into, you know, the step readout line, into the wood lines, onto the Uvus. Viper has been more efficient with no horseback, with his, you know, foot soldier man at arms, compared to the Lancers on horseback that should be able to move in quickly. That's impressive in itself. Now Viper yoinking resources from his opponent's side of the map with the Ford Keep as well. And I think we are arriving at the, the Imperial Age dominance point of the English. I mean, we said it right. Like, this is the time to do it. Once you reach past that, like, 45-minute mark, that's when England's win rate seems to plummet quite a lot. But it has to be said in this Mongol matchup, I, I think we're still pretty comfortable. Like, the Mongols, really, the, the way it works for them is once all the gold is gone, game over, right? Like, you get such a huge eco booster there. And because you play on one TC as well, like, once you lose all that gold, all of a sudden, you just flatline. And it has to be said, he's going to flatline soon. Right, because even if he moves across, even if he denies this gold and gets it back in his favor, look how far he has to go. That's a long run for villagers and even longer run for a step readout, and there's no other gold nearby. So this will hurt him if he's forced to replace his unit soon. Because as it stands, like they haven't reached pop cap. And there might be a fight underway soon. Because Viper, like, he's almost there. He's gonna want to make a move, and he's on his way in now. Trebs are gonna stand their ground, but remember, vision advantage, he doesn't see these scrims until it's too late. Gets away just in time, though. Shutter trigger upgrade has come out. Now, that's an important detail to highlight here. Clad Kaka, yes, he did. He went for the Siege Workshop, thank God. Still no greased axles, though. An important detail, by the way. A lot, and I mean a lot, of Mongol players forget to drop a Siege Workshop in Imperial. And it means they never get the Shutter trigger, so they don't get the additional range on their Spirals. They never get access to any of these techs, in fact. Any, well, basically, all of them being just wonderful and very powerful. And remember, it's a bigger deal for the Mongols at this stage in the game, because now you have Springle Divine. Remember, you get the improved Shutter Triggers. You're at 13 tower range. Meanwhile, Viper, he's stuck at his baby 12 right now. Has to be said, he does have an attack speed buffer, though. But he has to get in range, and that's the difficulty he's going to have. And that is a mistake. They're on auto attack. Viper, no! Oh, he realizes it's too late. That's a heavy hit there. Six Springles now compared to the four. It's not the end of the world for Viper, though. And now he'll look to defend himself. He's got two keeps working to protect him, one of them being the Berkshire Palace. And remember, folks, these keeps, they can produce units as well. So they do function as a forward staging point for the Viper. And meanwhile, it's now Horseman, Elite Horseman, in fact, Viper. The damage he could do here might be irreparable for Clad Kaka. Clad Kaka is kind of stretching himself thin. Look at the income per minute situation. Food, Viper has a clear lead there. Wood, competitive at the moment. Gold, Viper's ahead as well. But most of that wood gathering, it, it's all here, right? And just a few horsemen could do so much damage at this point in the game. They hit hard. And if I'm not mistaken, yeah, there's still no textiles out of Kakaka. This is going to hurt. You can see Viper, he's distracted in the front. He's going to force a fight there. Kaka is fully invested. And in the meantime, Viper is going to wrap around, but he's not going for the wood line. He's going deeper. I don't know if this is the right move. I think he's looking for the gold line instead. The gold line has already been depleted. But fight underway, and Clad Kaka losing a lot of troops as it stands. The man at arms, they get through the front line, all of a sudden they've got trouble. As the Lombos have got the fire arrow upgrade, and they start to hurt. Mago's being built, more Spruins as well, but that's the thing. Viper, he, he doesn't care anymore, right? He can just assassinate these Maganels, and it's just Spruins. You no longer have anti-clump. Meanwhile, Viper, he has solutions, right? If he needs anti-clump late game, he can always think about going into the Trebs. Maybe going for the Shattering Projectiles. I think this is still bugged, though, so a lot of players don't. And uh oh it happened. It happened. Bad Kaka, did he get away? Okay, yeah, he shifted away a lot of the wood line. In fact, all the wood line. He'd done it quick enough. Good play by him. Because Viper was... He should have been in sooner. Bad Kaka saw him the whole time. Had Viper gone in straight away, he would have been able to assassinate several villagers there. But instead, it's a bad trade up against Man at Arms. Elite Man at Arms at that. However, wrap around on the north side as well. And this is the concern. Clad Kaka is running out of places to run and hide. And these horsemen, I, this might be the variable that matters, folks. Horsemen are an incredible unit this late into the game. Elite horsemen doing 15 damage, 180 health, and moving 1.88 tiles. It can just tear you left, right, and center. And even with the yam movement speed that Clad Kaka has, he's going to struggle to replace 
uh, he's going to struggle to respond, rather, to all of these assaults. You can see the man-at-arms moving out now. Sure, they got 1.29, they got 1.65 when they charge, but it, it doesn't even compare in charge form to the 1.88. Man-at-arms moving in, denies the outpost going down. But notice that Viper, it's two-pronged attacks, right? It's not all in a one. And it really feels like his opponent is being forced to respond with pretty much the entire battalion in one location. Gold Hat upgrades on the Elite Man at Arms now as well. So they become ridiculously tanky. And we talked about this before, that they will take better trades up against the Mongol Man at Arms. The only advantage you have of Mongol Man at Arms, of course, is the movement speed. In the meantime, the Horsemen, they're the ones that have the true movement speed that we were just highlighting. And they're using it to raid on the sides. And the irony sets in, right? You're 40 minutes into a game and the Mongol player is the one getting raided. And a push forward, Treb's coming out onto the outpost network. More horsemen arriving. And it really is just becoming a resource slog. And look at the resources right now. Only one player is holding good surplus and one player is ahead in all income minus the stone. And that's simply because of the passive generation for Clyde Kaka. He's very much being denied. And he doesn't have much to fall back on. He can't play into crossbows, he's up against longbows. He can't play into archers, up against longbows. You know, horsemen, I don't know if you want to go that way because you're already being out produced on the horseman front and you don't have the infrastructure to really support that big of a count. Meanwhile, when you look into, into Viper's base, where, where are they stables? There they are. Yeah, I think Viper has the uh, the stable production advantage, folks. In fact, Viper has the everything production advantage. This is the issue for Clad Kaka. He can't replace his army quick enough and they found the step read out. The horsemen, they finally find the premium target and so many villages out of location. Clad Kaka, down at 73 eco, has to run away. His gold is already draining. He'll react to this, but you don't even need to kill the villagers. You just have to stop them gathering. Meanwhile, the assault in the north continues. Maganel's being sniped out. Maganel's the unit can no longer replace due to the lack of gold. And no anti-clump means no way of dealing with the Viper Zerg. And it looks like England just might have cinched this one. They will. GG comes out. Understandably, Kaka realizes when he's beat. And the kryptonite, the Mongols, is revealed their biggest strength, their biggest weakness. As soon as they run out of gold, they run out of time. And it seems all too easy for the snake to take the win. Oh, what a play. What I, I mean, I've got to give credit. credit to you. That was actually really well played in the late game. Like, really big credit to Le Viper. I mean, we, we talked about it, right? Like, England kind of has this timing um, where it's weird. Between about the 35-45 minute mark is one of the strongest win timings uh, alongside, like, the, the pre-tenant, 10-minute. Uh, but then when they get to like the hour mark, they fall off a bit. But the cool thing for Viper is he understands in this matchup, he never really falls off. The Mongol player has to end the game. And I think the Mongol player missed the trick. I do really think like coming back to that that discussion that was brilliantly brought up by Nevik. Shout out to Nevik, what's up, bud? Um, he mentioned like, do you think he should be going for like the TC uh, or should he like, you know, fall back uh, or, or go, go all in, right? That was what you asked. And I think genuinely like he can still pressure. He can still be a little bit harassy, but he can go into the second TC. Um, mainly because like Viper didn't start to play aggressive with the man at arms until about, I'd say the 30 minute, 25, 30 minute mark. So like Viper, like I think the, the thing Klakaka done really well was that he he was playing very well like with pocket forces on the flanks and Viper was over calibrating his response, right? Like it was overkill the amount of troops he was sending in a lot of cases. And that bought a lot of time, wiggle room for Klakaka to, to go for the second TC. Had he done that, it's a gamble, but I think it's the way you get back in. I think you missed your timing at that stage in the game. I do think the outpost coming down, uh, coming in a lot sooner would have been beneficial. And also um, not getting baited in. Like I think one of the, the critical mistakes that happened in that early assault was when uh, the the man at arms line chased the, the archers all the way back into the base and then the villagers killed the Maganels. Like it's that kind of annoying thing that I think a lot of people struggle with against England because like they're frustrating, right? Lombos are pew pew in your pile. Like, God damn it, I hate these guys. So you're like, I need to punish this. This is stupid. So you, you chase them in. And then all of a sudden you remember, oh, so I'm in their base now. Oh, no. You just watch everything just get enveloped from the sides. I think it's like an easy bait that a lot of people fall for. But I'm noticing that that was actually, oh, that's your Smurf. There you go, folks. Nevix. Nevix, a, uh, a very highly skilled Overwatch player. Turned Age of Empires 4, hopefully soon pro on lands. I'm hoping to see it. It'd be fantastic to see. Um, always glad to see him. Damn, I didn't realize that was your Smurf, though. Awesome. It's <laughs> just... So I've just been like, I've just been flaming you. That's good. That's good. Nah, I don't feel that's flaming. I, I try to make sure that I'm always like, if I'm going to call something wrong or whatever, I try to give like, you know, justification. Instead of just going, noob report, go back to Overwatch and being Reinhardt, man. We do not need you here.
Sure. Uh, nah, <laughs> nah, I try to like be kind of, you know, assessing on it. I, I think like, I, I can see why you fought for the all-in, right? Because like you, you have a staging point, but it's almost like a bait if you can't get enough ground. You agree with all my feedback? Guys, you see that right there? You see that right there? A top 100 Age of Empires 4 player says everything I said was correct. I have a big penis. Everything I said was correct. That was what he just said.